Welcome to Vigorous Health, I'm Coach Steve. I want to dedicate an entire video to the interpretation of scientific evidence because the science of today might not be applicable to your bodybuilding or fitness aspirations. Now, when you look at the current scientific literature in regards to performance enhancing drugs, for example, or medicines that are used as a performance enhancing drug, off-label, off-script, most of those studies were performed in vitro which means in a petri dish and they either use a human cell or a bacteria cell or an animal cell and they control all the variables that way. But when it comes to bodybuilding, even though you think you're controlling all the variables, everybody's supplementation protocol is going to be different. So for example, when they examine anadrol or primabolin with regards to red blood cell production and they use stem cells from bone marrow coming from rats or rodents or mice, for example, they do that in a petri dish where they control all the variables, the results that they get in that study might be completely different to an individual who's a vegan, doesn't get enough iron and vitamin B12 in their diet and decides to use anadrol at a different dose compared to the study which was performed in vitro on animal tissue. So there might be a huge discrepancy between the scientific literature and your individual real world results, even though the compounds are exactly the same. So you might not get the same result based on what you've read and researched on PubMed, Google Scholar, Science Direct, because sometimes the real world application varies differently from the scientific evidence, especially if that scientific evidence is only performed in vitro animal studies or in medical settings on humans. And you gotta remember there's a fourth step here, which is the athlete. So when you go through the scientific literature, you'll have to look at it at a couple different phases. First, there's theoretical science, which forms a hypothesis. And then based on that hypothesis, they will formulate a study. First phase is usually done on in vitro subjects. So that's either gonna be bacteria or human cells or animal cells. Then if that passes and the result is as expected, they will try to prove that in animal studies. If that result is, is as expected, they will move on to human subjects, which are gonna be clinical trials in most cases, if that's ethically feasible. So for example, they did a DNP studies on women in the 1950s, and a large amount of those women developed cataracts. Now in 2020, I don't think a study like that would ever get performed in human subjects again, because it's not considered ethical, right? Because it's a herbicide, it's used in explosives, and a lot of people have died from DNP overdose. So keep in mind that these obscure niche and perhaps unethical studies, which were performed before the Anabolic Steroid Control Act of 2004, they might not be replicated today because it's considered unethical. So you can't really prove if those studies from the 50s, 60s, 70s, or at least before 2004 still hold up today. If those results would still be replicated with a follow-up study proving or disproving whatever results they got back then. Even though they're very interesting. They're very interesting to read, but it might not be science of today and they might not be replicated again for the unethical reasons. Now there's a fourth phase, which is very interesting for us as bodybuilders and fitness enthusiasts, and that's human studies performed specifically on athletes. Yeah, that's us, that's the subject group that you identify most with. So when you look at all the subject groups in humans, for example, if you're a man, an enhanced man that's athletically inclined and goes to the gym regularly and follows a diet, structured, yeah, you take care of your supplementation, etc. everything is controlled, your samples, your individual sample size is completely different than examining cancer in postmenopausal women of advanced age. So let's say the, the women are between 50 and 75, they're all postmenopausal, they developed breast cancer, they were prescribed either uh, mastron, tamoxifen, uh, aromatized inhibitor, and they got certain results. Yeah. So that sample size is completely different than your individual and current situation. So you can draw a conclusion and, and read through the study and go over the results and all the testing parameters and analysis, <laughs> but whatever results they got in that study might not be applicable to you. Keep that in mind because you don't want to cherry pick these articles expecting a certain result and that way you try to replicate this result in the real world, it's not going to happen. We can take the now very well known Cargreen study for example, which was performed on gene mutated mice which are now genetically inclined to develop colon cancer. And in this study, cargarine was shown to increase the rate of colon cancer development 
again in mice who are already genetically predispositioned to colon cancer further compared to not taking cartery. Yeah, so they already, they're already going to get colon cancer and cardarine accelerated the rate of development. Now, in that study, if they would have done a comparative analysis with IGF-1, growth hormone, carbohydrates, excluding vitamin C, which has been shown to reduce cancer growth and formation and might actually reverse the progression of certain cancers because vitamin C has so much antioxidant properties and vitamin C is also a metabolic placeholder for glucose. Glucose converts into ATP, which is readily used by the cancer cells. But when vitamin C takes its place, there's minimal ATP production, especially when glucose or carbohydrate intake is restricted, which is always advised when cancer develops. So when I went through that study, all these variables that I just mentioned were not listed, but I could still contribute. So whether that's the glucose intakes or the exclusion of vitamin C or high growth hormone levels, high IGF-1 levels in these rats, which were already genetically predispositioned to develop colon cancer anyway. And cardiorim is shown to increase the rate of development, but not cause it because they were already going to get it anyway. Yeah. So when you look at the real world, cardiorim has now been used by millions of people. And I can't find one anecdotal evidence of anybody developing cancer by using cardiorim. And you know, it's been used by different kind of athletes and whether that's the cyclists or the bodybuilders or the strength athletes or the strongmen or, or long distance runners, it's readily used <laughs> and there's way around the drug tests. I don't know anybody that developed cancer from it, yeah? from using cardarine alone. So again, scientific evidence might not be applicable to the real world. Before you dive down the rabbit hole that is PubMed or Science Direct, I want you to classify yourself first. So are you a bodybuilder, a strength athlete? Are you an endurance runner, a cyclist, a swimmer? Identify who you are first, your age group, your sex, your genetic predisposition based on your family medical history. Do your, does your family have hair loss? Take that into consideration. Does your family have cancer? Take that in consideration. Kidney disease, diabetes, Whatever health condition you can find in your family, label yourself accordingly because that's going to determine whether some of the studies apply to your current situation or not. Keep that in mind. Now, when you've classified yourself, then you add on top the performance enhancing drug that you want to use and only that performance enhancing drug because the problem is performance enhancing drugs, for example, they, if they're examined on people and if that's women, then testosterone is not in that equation. So Primabol, Anadrol, Anavar, Nandrolone, Winstrol, Halotestin, all of those compounds that are FDA approved and used in clinical settings to cure people medically, those have been examined extensively. So you'll be able to find a decent amount of human studies and most of them are gonna be for specific illnesses or medical conditions. Yeah? Now, if you don't have any of these medical conditions, Again, those results might not apply, but you can still take something away from it and draw a conclusion whether you want to use it at a certain dose or in combination with something or the results completely turn you off and you scrap that compound off your experimentation list or to-do list or would like to try list, whatever list you have. Yeah? Hopefully you do adequate amount of research based on experience from knowledgeable coaches, for example, or knowledgeable people in the fitness industry combined with a little bit of self-researching on some of the studies that are available. And then when you find a couple studies that are actually applicable to your current situation and match very, very well compared to who you are as a person and the compound that you want to use, and the study is examined that in very similar settings, and now you can't go by the abstract because the abstract might give you different results or draw a different conclusion compared to reading the entire study. So when you look up the studies on PubMed, they have a title, they have the authors, the date, the sample size and the sample subjects, but even then sometimes they don't even list that. Then they have the methods of analysis, the results, and if you're lucky, you get a little bit of a discussion at the end. Again, it's only this much text. You can read through it in two minutes. You shouldn't base your conclusion and your decision to add a certain compound to your PED protocol based on that two minutes or five minutes of reading. 
Instead, read the entire study and look for any deviations or exclusions which were not mentioned in the results before you decide to use a compound or not. And also keep in mind that even though these studies are published on PubMed or Science Direct and they went through the peer review process, in the peer review process, there's still human error involved. And I can confirm that with several of my clients who are actually working in the medical field and are part of the peer review process. They say sometimes they miss something. And even though some of the studies passed the peer review process and 20 people were involved in that, in the review of everything and all the minute, minute details, they can still pick those studies apart from a biological standpoint. And they say they forgot these variables, they didn't discuss this, they didn't discuss this, what about this pathway, what about these enzymes, what about the temperature, etc. You can always pick it apart. So again, I honestly think that you need to be your own scientist if you want to do your own bodybuilding. And for that, you're going to have to make your own hypothesis, do your own experiment and back that up with blood work. <laughs> and that's really the only way how you would know if certain compounds are going to affect your body or not. So that's what I mentioned in the previous video about how to design your own cycle. You can do all the research you want, but whatever you read in the research, it might not be applicable to you. And perhaps the most applicable parts are going to be your real world results, which are valid for you, maybe a couple other people, but not for everybody. And those results you will get through experimentation based on the research. Yes, you'll still have to do the research, even though some of the research might not be applicable. You'll still have to do the research to get as much knowledge as you can before you decide to incorporate a compound or not. But you should be ready for all options. So whatever you've researched, there's maybe five different outcomes. You should be ready for all five and not cherry pick one outcome over the other four. I see that happen a lot in the fitness industry. Oh, this proves this. And they completely disregard the other eight outcomes. And now somebody that follows that advice are going to get completely different results. Again, do your own research and be ready for everything. It takes a significant amount of time. But when you do experiment to get that knowledge for yourself, that real world hard earned knowledge for yourself, you're ready for it. Go through all the medical literature and put that under a very detailed high resolution microscope using your knowledge and your experience that you have acquired in your years in the fitness industry, along your fitness journey and filter the scientific evidence before you apply it to your current situation. That's going to determine the success of your experiment. And if you don't put the science through your Watman filter of knowledge, you might not get the results that you were expecting. Yeah? Keep that in mind. I have an article about this. I'll link that down below. You can read about it again or listen to this video while you're reading it. Get a little bit of a different perspective because the article on my website contains all the important variables which you need to take into consideration when you're doing your own research. And I probably forgot to mention a few of them while recording this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.